present um, Hindu Reflections on Climate Change. I am so excited to present with us today, um, Gopal Patelji. Uh, just a quick background of our speaker today. Uh, Gopal Patel has been a faith-based environmental activist, campaigner, and consultant for over 10 years, working in India, East Africa, Europe, and North America. A recognized global leader in the religious environmental movement, he works regularly with religious and spiritual communities in addressing our current environmental crises. Gopal has been honored for his work by Prince Philip at Buckingham Palace, spoken at the White House, and is regularly invited by, to speak by the UN. He's a co-founder and director of Bhumi Global, a nonprofit organization that works to educate and mobilize Hindu communities globally for environmental action, and currently serves as an advisor on religion and sustainable development to the UN. Born and raised in England, he currently lives with his wife in Montclair, New Jersey. Thank you again, Gopalji, and I will turn the stage to you. Thank you so much, Vidima, for that lovely introduction and thank you to Columbia Hindu University Student Association for having me and thank you to all of you for joining us this um, Wednesday evening. I, I forget what date it was. Um, it's great to see some familiar faces and some and some new faces as well. So I appreciate that all of you are probably attending all of your classes online at the moment and so you're probably a little bit zoomed out um, just as most of the world is over the last 12 months. So we really want to make this session um, informal, interactive, and really have a have a discussion and a dialogue rather than me just downloading on you, which I'm sure your university professors are doing on a, on a regular basis. So the way we're going to structure this is that I'll speak for maybe 15, 20 minutes. So I hope, don't hope to speak more than that. Just to kind of frame, frame the conversation and frame the subject matter. Um, and then actually what we're going to do is break out into um, breakout rooms. Um, and I think Vidima and Vishwajit will, will arrange that, work their magic to do that. And then we'll have small group discussions and then we'll come back at the end and share in the wider group. So, um, so please be ready to engage in some discussion and dialogue with each other on the topic. Uh, as as Vinima mentioned, uh, I run an organization called Boomi Global. We're a nonprofit uh, 501c3 organization registered here in the US. And what we do is train and educate um, Hindus across the world when it comes to issues of climate change, biodiversity loss and other major environmental issues as well. Um, I've been doing this work now for about 10 years. And as Vidima mentioned, have worked across India, um, Africa, um, Europe and, and North America as well. And so we do training and education, we do research and we also do advocacy as well. And really what our work is about is trying to address the environmental crisis from a Hindu perspective and a Hindu lens. So that's asking ourselves, what can we take from Hindu traditions, Hindu communities, Hindu teachings around environmental care and how to live in the world? And how do you apply that to the contemporary environmental concerns, whether that's you know, pollution of our oceans and pollution of our air or, or increasing overconsumption or climate change or the extinction of wildlife and species such as um, insects and bees and, and, and different things like that. Um, we really try to put a Hindu perspective on the causes, but also more importantly, the solutions to those challenges. And also other things as well, such as um, we're working on a project right now to look at Hinduism and finance. We, we were asked a couple of years ago to look at um, what does a Hindu finance model look like? And so we've developed Hindu investment principles and we're about to embark on a multi-year research project to look at how you can mobilize funds and finance within the Hindu community to address environmental issues and support sustainable development around the world as well. So we're really trying to bring a whole gambit of Hindu perspectives to the range of issues that, that we find going on in the world. And the subject matter of today's session, of course, is climate change. It's um, one of the hottest things, no pun intended, in the world at the moment. Um, you know, for those of us who are here in the US, it's one of the four main priority areas for the current US administration. Um, this year, 2021, is going to be an important year when it comes to addressing climate change, when it comes to the UN level. And we're seeing right now, just in Texas and large parts of the US, just the devastating winter storm that's, that's hit large parts of the country. And you're seeing literally the effects of a rapidly changing world where it's not that everything is always hot and it's not that everything is always cold. It's just that you're going to see extremes on a more regular basis. And so we're literally seeing that right now 
in the United States. So if anyone here is calling in from Texas or any part of the country which is affected, I hope you're all safe. I'm glad to see that you all have electricity, but we know that a number of people um, in that part of the country have, have no electricity at the moment. So as I said, I'm not gonna try and talk too much, um, but let's look a little bit in terms of what are the um, underlying root causes of climate change, because I think a Hindu approach to any problem is to first look at, okay, what is causing this? What is the root issue here? And let's try to address that because Hinduism understands and teaches that, uh, that the external world is really a, a reflection of the internal world, that a change has to start from within, right? So if we look at climate change, we can see that it really, it's a symptom of a number of things that have been happening in the world really for a number of, for a number of years, a couple of hundred years, actually, to be precise, you know, and you could, we, we want, you know, we could say it's due to greed or, you know, overconsumption or overpopulation, as some people like to talk about, um, you know, but really, I would say that there are two key things, if we want to look at this from a, from a Hindu perspective, that we should really kind of drill down a little bit today. Um, the two really key issues are um, our connection with the world, and a spiritual disconnection that we may have on an individual and collective basis. And let me talk about that in a bit more detail. When I say our connection with the world, I'm talking about the current way that we all lead our lives and the current way that the world expects us to lead our lives. Like the, for example, the, the economy that we have. We have a, we have a growth-based economy in pretty much every single country of the world. We um, have the marker of GDP as a mark of success. So if your GDP goes up, you're seen as a successful country. If your GDP goes down, you're seen as a struggling country, right? But what GDP doesn't take into account is the environment. So a country can have excellent growth rates when it comes to its GDP, but could pollute all its rivers, cut down all its trees, um, have mass environmental destruction in its country, but if its GDP goes up, it's considered to be a successful country, right? So our current economic markers do not take into account the environment, both in terms of the environmental destruction that we may do in the course of economic development and growth, but there's also the fact that we depend so much on nature, on the natural world, for our economies, for our livelihoods. We don't take into account um, you know, the carbon that we're putting out in the air or the fact that we're dependent on air to breathe, which we all take for granted, or the water that we drink. So many what they call natural resources are so fundamental to our economies, but we don't really incorporate those into our economic models. And that's shifting quite a bit. And this way of life of kind of looking at the natural world as a commodity, as something that we just use and we take for granted that we don't really have to pay too much attention to kind of care and protect that worldview is not um it's not accidental there are two key moments in history where human society shifted its um, behavior and views when it comes to the natural world and i want to sh just quickly share those with you um the most recent one was in the mid 1700s to the mid 1800s. And it's what we all know is called the Industrial Revolution. Industrial Revolution, as you know, started in the UK, which is where I'm from, um, and really was a shift in the way that human society starting off in the Western world, looked at labor, looked at the way that we engaged with the natural world and shifted the way commerce took place, right? Machines replaced humans in tasks. Um, oil became a much more of a commodity that we were using a little bit later on. And it's the Industrial Revolution, it's from the late 1800s that you can see carbon emissions rise, start to rise significantly in the world. So the Industrial Revolution gave rise to what we call now as climate change, because in the late 1800s, you see the carbon emissions rising significantly. And the climate scientists now, whenever they measure carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, they use the late 1800s as their baseline. Right? So the Industrial Revolution was one key moment that put humanity on a new direction, a new track. The other one that a lot of people maybe don't pay much so much attention to, but is equally important, and it was quite a bit earlier, it was like in the late 1400s, and it's the arrival of Christopher Columbus to America. That moment significantly shifted the trajectory of the world, starting with Western civilization. 
when Christopher came, when, when Columbus came, I call him Christopher like I know him on a personal basis, I don't. When Columbus arrived in the US, the year after um, the Pope at the Vatican issued what was called the Doctrine of Discovery in um, 1493. Columbus, I think, came in 1492, 1493. The Doctrine of Discovery was issued by the Pope. And what that allowed and what that said was that Christians and colonize, well, Catholics and colonizers were allowed to go anywhere in the world and take over land, kill people if they didn't convert to Christianity. And at that moment, what you found was a significant shift in the way that mainly these colonizers viewed land, viewed wealth, viewed the natural world. They started to look at it as this is something that I need to colonize, I need to take over, I need to control. And so that doctrine of discovery really significantly paved the way for our current way that we engage with the world in a, on a GDP-based economy and that we look at the natural world as something that we can own, that we can control. So these are the two key moments, the Industrial Revolution, which was in the you know, 17 to 1800s, and the doctrine of discovery and Columbus's arrival to America. Um, you're all Americans, so you know more about Columbus than I do. We don't, they don't teach that in the UK, so I'm, I'm a student when it comes to that respect. So those are the kind of the, the material things that are kind of, we can say are the root causes when it comes to the current climate crisis that we're experiencing right now. The other thing which I wanted to flag is what I think those things have done is really led to a spiritual disconnection between humanity and the natural world. And stay, stay with me here on this point. Because what this current worldview has done has put the human at the center. Its, it's basic premise is that the world is here to serve me. The world is here to facilitate my, my desires. The world is here to make me happy, right? And that is fundamentally the opposite, I would propose from a Hindu worldview, which suggests that I am here to serve. I am here as part of a, a greater system, a greater body of people, a greater network, an ecosystem. And my service, my role as a Hindu is to contribute to others and contribute to the welfare of the world. It's not about response, it's not about rights, but it's about service. It's about responsibility. That really is very much a starting point of a Hindu worldview is that I have responsibility to contribute because if I don't take that responsibility seriously, I can cause a lot of destruction in the world. So I need to be very careful about how I engage with the world. I have to be mindful of Dharma, mindful of Ahimsa, mindful of Sattva. I have to be mindful of all these really wonderful Hindu values to ensure that my contribution is healthy and wholesome and contributes to the sustaining of the whole. Because if it isn't, then I'm contributing to the destruction, right? And so this worldview where it puts the human and the desires and the needs of the human at the center leads, I believe, to a spiritual disconnect where coupled with machines and urbanization, we're increasingly disconnected from the world around us, right? Very few of us now know where our food comes from. Very few of us now are in sync with the natural cycles of the earth and of the seasons. In many ways, we live in concrete jungles. You know, we're all students at Columbia. You know, I used to live in Manhattan. You know, you can live in Manhattan and not know what time of year it is because it's always nice. You know, you can eat any type of food because the food is coming in from all over the world. You can have mangoes in October. You can have strawberries in January. You know, that is such a, from a Hindu perspective, an unnatural way to live. A natural way to live is to live in with the rhythms and the cycles of the earth and to be in harmony with what is going on in our natural environment around us. So there's a material cause to the climate crisis, but more fundamentally, there's a spiritual cause as well, which is that disconnect from, from the world around us, right? Are you guys following me so far? Is that making sense? All right, okay. I'm gonna hopefully speak for like another five to seven minutes before we do our breakouts. So what's the Hindu approach? What's the Hindu reflection on this? I think we'll all agree that within Hinduism, nature is very much at the heart of a Hindu worldview and a Hindu practice. You know, you look at the deities, for example, you have Krishna and cows, you have Shiva with a bull and a snake, you have Durga riding a tiger, you have Ram and his army of monkeys. You know, Krishna lived in the forest, Ram lived in a forest. 
um, you know, you have, um, you know, uh, the first trees in the, the first temples in Hinduism were actually trees. You have the waters, you have the plants, you have the mountains that are all sacred. You have this really beautiful way of living that Hinduism encourages, which is to recognize the divinity of all natural life around us, right? Not just in us as humans, but recognize the divinity in the plant, recognize the divinity in the tree and the oceans and the plant and the wildlife around us as well. So this kind of, this worldview is very opposite, like I was saying earlier, to the current Western worldview um, that, that we kind of inhabit, you know, at the moment. And as I said earlier, the Hindu approach is, look at this complex system around me. It's so complex, it's so finely balanced. The Sanskrit is, is Ritta, um, R-T-A, I think that's from the um, Rig Veda or the Atharva Veda, I can't remember. But this understanding that there's a cosmic order, there's a cosmic balance in play, and we have to contribute to maintaining that balance, right? So that's where we start from this point of what is my contribution? How am I gonna uphold this balance around us? So that's the challenge for us as Hindus, I would, I would want to offer is what is our contribution? How best can we serve in this moment, right? I don't need to tell you um, the effects of climate change or how bad climate change is gonna be in the coming decades. You all are younger than me. You all have been living this, you know, you know from, from birth, I assume. So you know the significant crisis that we're facing when it comes to climate change and the biodiversity crisis and so on like that. So how do we serve? How do we show up? What is our contribution? What is our role to play? Because we all have a role. We all have a contribution, right? Some of us are leaders. We're going to be out, of, out in the front, you know, protesting on the streets. Some of us are going to be developing policy. Some of us are going to be developing green businesses. Some of us are going to make sure that the, um, the Hindu wedding sector becomes green and sustainable as much as possible. You know, we're all going to do something to ensure that the world is green and sustainable as much as possible. We all have to decide what that is for ourselves and how our contribution is going to be, right? But then the question before that, and this is what we're going to do in our, in our breakout groups, um, the question before that, before we do anything, we need to kind of do the inner work because as I said earlier, Hinduism really says that the outer world is a reflection of the inner world, right? And so what I want us to think about is how connected are we to the earth? When was the last time we felt, I really feel a connection to mother Bhumi? When was the last time that we were out in the natural world and just had a really great experience, whether it was at the beach or in the forests or um, you know, in a park, Central Park maybe. I know many of us are missing lovely Central Park. Um, you know, do we see the earth as a living being? Because in Hinduism, it strongly says that the earth is a living being, Bhumi, Prithvi, she is a goddess. Do we see the earth as something living or do we just see it there and take her for granted, right? And how do we develop that loving relationship with the earth so we, move into a relationship of respect and compassion and service rather than following everybody else, which is a relationship of exploitation for my own needs, but actually a relationship of service. So there are many ways we can talk about these issues, but I felt that for this call, and you know, we can organize other ones later in the year, but for this one, let's just get to the basics, you know, because the policy and the financing and everything will come later. But that will only come if we individually feel a connection to the earth and feel a, feel a level of responsibility to care for Mother Earth, for Mother Bhumi. So let's address that root issue first before we start talking about all the other changes that need to go out in the world, right? Let's, let's focus on ourselves. So um, like I said, the questions are, how do we feel connected to nature? When was the last time we felt that connection? Do we have any particular memories of being out in the natural world? It's interesting when, um, when research is conducted, most people say that their most spiritual experiences are out in the natural world. They rarely say that they feel the most spiritual in the church or the synagogue or the temple. They'll often tell you, when I'm at the beach, I feel connected. Or when I'm in the forests, I just feel this sense of wholeness that I don't feel anywhere else, right? 
And that's why in Hinduism, the forests were the first temples, right? So do we have those kind of memories? Can we connect to those? And then importantly, how can all of us develop that relationship? What can we do on our, in our daily lives to build that relationship with the earth? And what can we draw from our Hindu teachings and our Hindu upbringing and backgrounds to help us with that? Maybe there's a particular story that we like, or maybe there's a particular puja or something that we do that really makes us feel connected. Maybe there's a certain song or a certain hymn that we like to sing from Hinduism that makes us really feel connected. Maybe we have a Tulsi plant in our house. You know, we are probably one of the only religions where it's encouraged to have worship a tree on every single day, right? The Tulsi is a tree and most Hindu homes are encouraged to have a Tulsi plant, right? So maybe it's doing that, maybe having a Tulsi um, in your home or in your dorm room or something like that. So what from a Hindu perspective can we draw upon to build that connection with the earth? So those are the questions I want us to kind of get into a little bit in our, in our discussion groups and really want to encourage all of us to open our hearts a little bit and really think very seriously about, do we have this connection with the earth? And if we don't, how do we establish that? And if we do, how can, how can we increase that? So that's the, that's the invitation for the, for the breakout group. So um, Vidima, back to you. Sounds good. Thank you so much again uh, for the wonderful context setting and you beautifully went over the questions and I hope everyone here sort of, you know, internalized them. So now what we're going to do, as Gopalji mentioned, uh, we're going to divide ourselves into breakout rooms. So we'll have a host do that in a couple of seconds. Um, and like everyone mentioned, feel free to engage, you know, bring yourselves, be present in the conversations. And this will be about 15 to 20 minutes. Uh, so until then. one by one uh, with these questions for the next 20 to 15 minutes. Um, and I'd love to hear everyone's input, everyone's thoughts. So definitely don't feel shy or intimidated. And I think we'll have a great discussion. So I guess the first question here would be, how do you, in your lives, how do you feel connected to nature? And definitely, yeah, feel free to think about it a little bit, give it some thought. Don't need to answer it right away. Yeah, I think on my side, as Gopalji mentioned, you know, being out in nature definitely helps with that connection. Uh, luckily, I live in Jersey City, uh, so I can go out, you know, go by the waterfront, um, see things there. So I think that what makes me feel most connected. And uh, second is when we have any kind of natural disaster, of course, you know, too much snow out there. I think usually when I feel connected the most uh, to nature or try to feel connected is uh, when you're trying, I'm trying to de-stress. Um, so usually I will go hiking um, or just kind of like listen to the birds and that'll be soothing for me. Um, or just kind of like when you're walking outside from one destination to another, just paying attention to your surroundings and kind of um, breathe soundings and kind of um, breathing and uh, trying to stay connected to nature, um, taking a look at the trees, the trees are changing color, that kind of thing. Good evening, everyone. Um, I'm joining to you from Australia. Um, and it is Thursday morning over here. So um, I suppose when I feel the most connected with nature is when I'm actually home on my home country. So I'm, I'm an Aboriginal woman from Australia and um, I live about um, 12 hours away from my traditional um, lands. And um, so I feel the most connected and most grounded when I'm at home walking on country barefoot, um, just even if it's just sitting in my mum's backyard. Um, I'm really fortunate to live in a house where we have a pool in our backyard and we overlook um, a really small mountain with trees and stuff on. So I quite often go and sit in my pool and just look at the, the small mountain beside our house and watch the birds fly through the trees. It's, it's such a blessing to be able to be able to engage with nature in such a, an easy um, and easily accessible way every day. Yeah, so that's that's where how I connect with nature. Yeah. For me, uh, I mean, uh, at least before COVID, uh, I used to feel 
like connected with nature whenever i am in either mostly actually when i go for hiking or so when i am in some kind of forest environment that's where be silent i mean i used to sit silent and then i used to observe the like the sounds from the nature and that's when i used to feel more connected than in the cities and uh, we at least in covid i realized i mean that's not as much as like I, everyone saw that it was not possible and um, there i am not remembering the actual uh, shloka or something that is there but uh, one of my guru like he suggested a, some kind of uh, uh, shloka which remembers that uh, we are the nature and like praying to the earth and uh, asking for her forgiveness daily since we are stepping on it and hurting her kind of so that's something i started at least recently uh, in the covid to remember that we are together and we are with the nature so absolutely thank you everyone so much for sharing i think we have like so many uh different thoughts here whether it's you know actually being present through hiking through actual activities um connecting with our homelands or even and i love this perspective bringing sort of nature internally and feeling connected to nature internally through verbalization so i love all these different perspectives that we have and sort of a follow up question i know a little bit some of us talked about this a little but when was the actual last time that you remember feeling connected to the earth I mean, I can share. Um, it was like my last India trip, like last year. Um, I mean, since then it's just like concrete around. But I think that's when I kind of went to our like traditional farm. It was like a paddy, like rice field, and it was like huge. I think just walking on it and then just like water, like there was like a small kind of tunnel and stuff like that. So I think that was kind of when that I felt most connected or like the closest to nature. It, it also felt like. uh i mean this might go into like whatever gopal ji said about business but like owning the land i think that is also a different kind of connection in a sense not owning or like just being part of whatever happens in the land like farming or like stuff like that is also a different level of connect for me um probably uh the last full moon for me because it's like i i noticed the full moon and i just kind of like contemplated a little bit um and then you kind of think about that process of like oh other people on this earth are also seeing the same moon um and it just kind of makes you feel more connected to the earth that way because it's like a planetary body that or not a planet but a, another body that's not part of the earth so in a way kind of like contemplating that it, something that's not the earth and it makes you feel more part of the earth. For me I think uh, last time when I I mean when I actually went to India uh, I felt jet lag and I couldn't sleep like we all have jet lags during it but uh, while I was adjusting to the uh, like jet lag uh, I was uh, since I was unable to sleep uh during the night times there so i try to maintain the balance and try to wake up early and just try to do some uh, meditation in some silent place because since i was unable to sleep anyway so i sort of woke up early uh, and tried to do meditation so that's when i felt like in that silence uh, early morning uh, while doing meditation i felt like more connected with the nature during that time Yeah, absolutely. Does anyone else want to share for this question? If not, we can absolutely move on to the next one, but uh don't let me hold anyone back uh by moving on to the next question. Okay. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. Did someone want to go? I Okay. Awesome. Um all right, second or third question, a little bit more related to that, but I think diving more into the specifics here. Do you have a particular memory? of being in nature and this could be like a really strong memory either you know from when you were younger it could be like a recent memory that um it doesn't have to be the last memory it can just be a point in time i think where you had felt really connected to nature 
Uh, maybe I can start here simply because I, I had one quite recently and it was really, really nice. Uh, so the place that I live in California, um, the good thing about it is that it's, um, although it has like its suburban parts, it has lots of expanse of hills and just hills and hills just looking down. And I think um, on my birthday, I was just so stressed out. I just wanted to get away from everything. And, you know, I was able to hike up as many of you have to the top of the hill and just look out and honestly I didn't even know I was doing this but I had just started crying because I don't know just being in nature and realizing um how beautiful and how expansive and how powerful it is and how minuscule I am compared to that or how really just enveloped I am in that huge creation just made me you know stand back for a moment and just be shocked and allow myself to take that in so that was a particularly strong memory I had I had a bit of a similar experience. I got a chance to travel to New Zealand a few years ago. And while traveling in New Zealand, we would go across these giant beaches, mountains, and volcanoes, etc. So just when you're visiting these places, you just realize that we are a very small part in a large scheme of things. Uh, that, you know, we are not the, you know, the superpower, superhumans that we sometimes feel like but we are very infinitesimal small, small tiny being compared to the earth and the nature that has been here for you know millions of years so i think that makes you uh, understand your place in this in the larger scheme of things and realize you know uh, that you know there's something that has been there for thousands of years and something we shouldn't be ruining Yeah, I think my, my experience is similar to, to your guys' in the sense of like um, ex experiencing a new part of nature that you haven't before. Um, so I think tra like when I traveled a, a year or so ago to Costa Rica, um, I, you know, I, I got involved in some ecotourism and learned about like all of the different species and never knew some of these species even existed. And um, in rainforest and cloud forest. So kind of learning about the diversity of the earth and of nature um, is, a, is a really profound thing. Like, you know, you can constantly be learning something new and adding um, value to your life and your knowledge. Um, I think that's, that's pretty meaningful to me. Um. I suppose, again, there's, there's still similar experiences of being in places that are new, um, naturally, um, in, in natural environments. So um, being, uh, was fortunate to travel to New Zealand last year as well. And um, just going, uh, sailing around the fjordlands, watching the water um, come down, uh, cascade down the, rock faces, um, watching trees growing out of rocks where the, um, where the roots grew across the, the rocks really, I suppose, spoke to me in that nature finds a way and that life will triumph um, through adversity as well. And so it's just a reminder that like nature teaches us lessons wherever we go and yeah, just to see life thriving in really um, challenging places. Uh, it's quite a profound um, experience, yeah. Uh, for me, uh, I recently started doing uh, some, uh, so I started digging more into uh, like Hindu rituals and all and started doing Sandhya Vandanam, which is taught by uh, one of my guru. And, um, in that, uh, I am not a Sanskrit expert, but uh, while he was explaining like each uh, each sloka or everything, uh, like while doing it and while listening from him, I realized how profound those slokas were. I mean, I had a different feeling before and after doing it, knowing with the meaning and each of the sloka uh, made me feel how connected we are to the nature and that's I cannot forget that the next time or every time I see this loka. So that's something I felt very good. I think for me, like there were two kind of incidents when uh, there was this goshala in Hyderabad where like 
it's like a cow um like people adopting those cows and just having all of them at one place and just like you know feeding them or just like touching them i don't know it was kind of like a different feeling uh like i know like people say they're like sacred and stuff like that but i don't know it's kind of like felt like some kind of connection and i think i had similar experience when i went to a elephant sanctuary in kerala near a temple so i think this temple is very famous for um elephants it's called guruvayur it's in kerala and i think they they have a huge uh, elephant sanctuary and they're like not too uh, controlled so they're like very free to move around even though it's like a sanctuary where like people can go visit and stuff like that so i felt like like people bathing them uh beating the elephants and stuff like that it was kind of like i don't know uh, like what's the difference between you know like an animal and me or like uh some kind of just thoughts that came in and i think they were kind of really nice because we usually trying to communicate with dogs or like pets usually but like some kind of bigger animals um i don't know just a different feeling absolutely yeah i love every perspective that everyone has brought here it seems like in in so many ways and i think in different ways we've all been able to engage and really understand nature and keep those memories dear to our hearts it seems like all these memories are like very intimate as well and i think that's just very telling of what nature is uh, like allowed to evoke in us um and i guess another another way that i'd like to sort of sort of shift the conversation is more into i guess how more shifting into how we can go ahead and include nature a little bit more in our lives so I guess one of the questions here is what can we do to maybe feel more connected with the outdoors within our daily lives within our day-to-day -day routines what could be some potential ideas there uh, one thing uh, at least i started thinking recently was uh, i mean we are hearing a lot about global warming warming or this pollution right so uh we can maybe take our time maybe one weekend or one day to sit and see water or daily life practices or and water something that we can you know try to not avoid at least try to reduce gradually which is not eco friendly and just start practicing them slowly incorporate maybe one habit daily or two habits daily so that it will be useful not just for us but in the long run for the nature and nature is for everyone not just for us and like like uh, gopal ji said uh, it should come from inside and that's where i think that will be helpful for us to contemplate and implement those habits yeah i think i agree with you about um implementing like parts of nature into your daily habits um one thing when i visited my grandparents uh that i noticed was like every day they uh when they cook and they um prepare rice they um they have like a block of stone and they offer some of the rice to the crows and they call the crows and the crows come and eat the rice and they watch that and then they eat and it's like um they do that every morning before lunch time um and my my grandmother has um like a jasmine bush and you know she collects all of the um jasmine that's bloomed and then puts that as a garland and offers that to god um so like these things i guess um i don't live in a tropical environment where i have crows that will eat rice um but i think having like a you know like a tulsi plant or having a plant and just waking up every morning and looking at the plant and watering it and caring for for nature like that i think um having that kind of ritual will help us stay connected on a daily basis to nature uh one of the experiences I was going to talk about earlier was um when you asked about when was the last time you felt connected to the earth and i'm really fortunate that we actually have garden at, at our house that where we can plant and um produce our own vegetables so we grow like eggplants and tomatoes and pumpkins and things like that um so um not only is that sustainable in that we are producing our own food without having to pull from um other places um but it's also um in gives me time to go and 
be in nature and to tend to the plants to ensure that they are, are thriving as much as um, uh, as as they can be. Um, we also have things like worm farms um, that we um, make that we re put all of our scraps in, recycle every bit of paper that comes into our house gets shredded and put into the worm farms as well as um, like there's the yeah, leftover food scraps and things like that. So we try to be um, sustainable in those practices, but also that that then nourishes the, the gardens that which provide us food. And so it's like this cycle that, uh, and it teaches my children the, the um, connectedness, the interconnectedness between our activities and what we do and um, uh, the, uh, the production of, of food to eat. So yeah, that kind of, that's how we do it. Beautiful. I love I love hearing all these experiences and these ideas so much. I'm I'm hearing a lot of you know rituals, a lot of um, you know passing on generationally um, the just love for nature. And I think these are such good ideas. And you know if you all are comfortable and if you'd like to share back in the main room, which we're going to head out to right now, please feel free to. You guys all had some wonderful, really really nice thoughts. And uh, thank you again for, you know, being in this group and being so present and engaged. I loved interacting with all of you. And so, yeah, let's let's head back to the main room. Thank you for facilitating this, too. Of course, of course, my pleasure. Being with nature, um, how can we include more connection with the natural world in our day to day life? And then if there's anything Oh, Arman's put it in the chat. And if there's anything we can draw upon from our Hindu background or, or teachings or life that can help us with this connection. So um, yeah, let's open the floor. How do these questions sound? Do we want to talk about something else? We can also do that, you know, um, just what, what's coming up for people on, on this topic. I guess I'll start. Um... There was, I was trying to like think back to the last time I was like actually in nature, but um, then I remembered that actually just last night, there was this like, I was trying to fall asleep. And after having looking, looked at screens for so long, I was having a little bit of a tough time doing that. But I was just like listening to my breathing and it like reminded me of the sound of like an ocean. Um, and at that point I was like, oh my God, I, I feel like there are times when you, when you think about the earth as like being, as like living. And then I mean, obviously that's not always on my mind. And so then there are moments like that when I'm like reminded of it, where I was just like listening to myself and thinking about like, wow, if we think of the oceans as like the earth breathing. Um, and I felt really connected in that moment. I, get, I would have a question. What does it mean to feel connected to nature? You know, I don't really know what the question means. I mean, I, I guess in my day-to-day, -day, I'm connected to whatever I'm working on, whether it's work or just, you know, uh, the people I'm hanging out with. But if I'm connected with nature versus disconnected, what does that even mean? Mm -hmm. I would definitely feel like if when the last time I was out in, uh, out in the woods or whatever, that was definitely a very nice feeling, nice to be in nature. But... Um, but yeah, what else, what else do you guys think? I guess something I can add to that is because of COVID, um, you know, going to public places is not a thing anymore. And the only way that you feel a little bit safe, at least for, um, I think in the city for me and Chetan, the only way we feel safe, I think, hanging out with people is mostly outdoors. Um, so definitely had, you know, a, we've, visited more parks in the past year than we have in the entirety of um, the two years we'd been there like previously to COVID. Um, we'd gone to like literally the main ones, but now we visited smaller parks, parks that we've never even heard of. And I think that is a little bit of like appreciation from our side that we have all these areas available to us that in, a, in also another way are clean and like other people are there also enjoying these areas. I think that's like a real privilege for us. And I think this year we like got to take advantage of that. Um, even there were a couple of weekends that we 
drove to other places in the Northeast that we've never been to. Um, he just, while he was, he, the kitchen's right here. So Chetan can hear everything we're talking about. And he even mentioned, we went to like Acadia national park and that was like never on our list or on our radar, but we decided to, you know, go on hikes and go see the water. We love water. Um, I think that's when I think the connection to earth makes, I don't know, maybe it's earth or what it is, but I think like the going on a beach and just sitting there and just watching the sun go down is something we really enjoy. Um, so I think that's something that I think COVID actually just kind of, it brought back to us to really enjoy and just go out and see, um, you know, the world as it is. Yeah, I think it's definitely, I think what you're sharing there, Bavisha, is like, I think a lot of people are feeling that, that COVID is forcing them to kind of like go outside and go to new places, but also go to places where people aren't, which is like, you know, in parks and, and, and so on like that. And a lot of people are definitely feeling what you're feeling, which is like an increased appreciation or an increased, an increased realization that they need that connection with the, with the earth, you know, because previously it was like, home to the subway station, subway station to the office, you know, to Starbucks or something, then back home, you know? And so when, the, when all that gone, we need to find a replacement for that. And people are finding it definitely in parks and beaches, like you're saying, yeah. And is that something that you grew up with? Like, with, as a, you know, as growing up, would your family intentionally go to parks and the beach and stuff like that? Or is that something you've had to discover as an adult? Because I find you know, my parents, I'm an immigrant in the UK. I find with a lot of immigrant families, like that kind of vacation isn't normal. You know, we usually go and visit family. That's the vacation, you know, but to go to a park or to the beach would be like, what are you doing? You know, so I'm just wondering how that, if that's been part of your journey as well. It's funny that you say that because I think my parents gave me a unique upbringing where they actually really enjoyed travel. Mm -hmm. So we've, you know, visited more than half the states in the US. We've done a few international trips and we always definitely try to have, I think, a couple days of activities and a couple days of just sitting on a beach or in the forest, wherever, you know, the terrain takes us. But for, you know, my parents, they do go out on walks a lot. They, you know, liked, they like keep that as their exercise. And me and Jathan definitely don't do that. Actually, in that way, we're really happy we're getting this puppy because we feel like we're going to go out more and not just stay inside and like work till like 9 p.m. on our laptops. Um, you know, he's going to, it's a he, he's going to force us to actually go out and be a part of the world. Um, so it's bringing back a little bit of childhood. I think my parents really appreciated uh, being out and about. And I think that appreciation is like slowly coming back for, for me. So it's, yeah, it's been nice. That's great. Yeah. Gaurav, I'm wondering if you could share your experiences in, you know, I've been to Mumbai many, many times. It's one of my homes, um, yeah. you know, and it's like, it's great. I love it because it's by the ocean, but at the same time, the traffic, you know, and, and everything like that. And, um just wondering what your experiences are like trying to experience nature and be outside in the world without all that pollution and noise in mumbai what your experiences have been with that yeah so i don't actually much remember if i was actually traveling before covid lot because it was kind of an hectic schedule but then the experience that i have had wherein i kind of felt very deeply connected to the environment or to the nature as such was when I was actually flying to New York. So I, I knew I was going to miss Mumbai a lot. So I just got in the plane. I was near the window. And when, when I was up above, that's when it all started coming back. Like, like we have these international boundaries wherein we think, oh, no, this is India, this is Pakistan, this is Afghanistan, Iran, Iraq, UK, whatever. But then when you are up and if you can see what's happening actually below, everything basically seems the same to any person. And that's when you, like, that's when I got the, like, I, I got connected or maybe a bit more emotional yeah, to the earth as such. Yeah, so that's how it went for me. <laughs> yeah, and I do miss Mumbai and the sunsets by Marine Drive. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, the, 
the famous Chowbody Beach. We all, we all, I'm sure many of us have good experiences there. Yeah. And that's, it's actually nice when you go to Mumbai, like early morning, you just see people of all ages, all kind of like people from all different backgrounds walking along the beachfront. You know, like you go five, six o'clock in the morning, you see so many people out walking yeah. and it's, it's so nice to see that. Yeah, yeah it's a pretty place. Yeah. <laughs> it's like Manhattan, it's geographically like Manhattan. Right. But yeah, it's, it's a different way. Yeah. 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 Do you think, um, this is a question I have, do you think the future is where it's going to become increasingly difficult to be connected to nature, right? Like the, when you said you flew in the plane, I was like, yeah, that was a gr that's a great time when you're like flying over to the world where you can see everything and you, I totally get that, like you feel connected. But I'm, I'm just thinking like 50 years from now, what if the world looks different and this is so much difficult to get it connected? I don't know, just, but uh, it's already pretty difficult today, but I don't know. Question for me. I, I, I haven't thought upon these lines yet, but I don't know. Yeah, I was just throwing that out there, but uh, but yeah. Looks like Natasha may have a response to that. Yeah, no, kind of going along that, I was just thinking about like other times when I had been like thinking about these sorts of things, and I was thinking about watching like planet Earth, mm. and it's it's just like absurd that it it's like watching a TV show is like when I think about like wow animals are just like us or like wow I'm just like that you know a TV show it's not even just like looking at like a caterpillar actually outside, um, and so. Yeah, I, I do definitely like question what that looks like in the future. Um, but personally, I feel like as long as there are like trees around me, that has always been like something that brings me back. Like anytime I'm walking somewhere, like walking to class or like the grocery store or something, and just like looking at trees as I'm walking by is always like very grounding. And so that's sort of reassuring, I think, as long as that's a thing. Um, they can't oh, chop right. down all the trees, right? <laughs> <laughs> you couldn't possibly get all of them. For sure, yeah. I, I should definitely go outside more. I, I feel like I'm in my room seven days a week. I can't believe I just said that out loud, but it's definitely not far from the truth, but I'm going to go out more. Definitely. Well, it's kind of like, it's... um. I think a lot of us in that situation, you know, like I'm like that, like my wife goes out for like one or two hours a day for a walk, you know, I sometimes go like two, three days without even going outside, you know, and it's like, I feel on one level, I feel fine doing that because that's my habit. But as soon as I step outside, I'm like, oh, I should do this more often, you know, but it's that effort of like, especially when the weather's like this, of like putting on that heavy jacket and the snow boots and everything like that. You know, I'm like, I ain't got time for that. I got to work. I got work to do. Yeah. I got webinars to organize. You know, it's just like yeah. you know. But as soon as I step outside, I'm like, oh, this feels so nice. And I and I forget that feeling when I'm back in my office working. You know, and it's like, it's like a muscle, like building that muscle. Not, not like a physical muscle, but like that mental muscle. But like, I need to make this as part of my. It's almost like in Hinduism, we have this this idea of sadhana of of like a regular spiritual practice, right? Whether it's your your japa or like whatever it is, like there should be some kind of regular spiritual practice we do, right? As Hindus. And it's like, I kind of feel like the sadhana for the 21st century is go outside and get some fresh air. You know, it's like, that's the thing that like all of us struggle to do, especially those of us living in, in, in major cities. Yeah. So your, your struggle there is, is shared. I'm, on, I, I, I'm with you there with that one. Sounds good. <laughs> I wanted to piggyback off of one thing Natasha said about like animals. Um, I recently like, um, randomly Googled because I heard about it a couple of years back, but like these robots that are like cleaning the ocean. And I thought that was really cool. And I like looked it up and there's like definitely like a lot of different companies out there. And I figured that like, there's actually one company um, uh, in like San Diego or something like that. And I was thinking to myself, like, you know, we eventually, we're, we're both from California. We want to eventually move back home. Um, and I feel like because of access to the Pacific Ocean, it'd be really cool to like one day like volunteer for an organization like that, because I know that they do have like volunteering. I think I don't think you have to go out with the robot, but I think there's some you know sort of thing that you have to do with the robot before and after it comes from the ocean to the ocean. Um, so I was just thinking about that. I was, and then we, just the other night we were talking about how like 
it'd be so incredibly amazing to see like a blue whale. And like, it's just crazy to think that there's enough space on this earth. And we don't even think beyond the two mile radius that we're at because that's where our Uber Eats is. But to think that there is, you know, an area on this earth that can like fit a blue whale. And it's just, it's like kind of mind blowing sometimes when you like zoom out, you know, just like on a plane type of a thing. Um, but yeah, I know, I know like, like an ocean cleanup or something, some kind of like volunteer work like that. I think being um, Hindu, I think there is that perspective of wanting to like give time to something that you really enjoy and that you think will be good for the environment. Um, so I think that's like, I just remember that as Natasha was uh, speaking about animals. So I wanted to share that. Yeah, thank you so much. There's, um, you know, there's, um, there's this, there's this, in there's this train of thought, which I, which I kind of agree with a lot, which is that, you know, in a lot of ways, modern science, modern technology has kind of taken the wonder and the mystery out of the natural world. You know, like we live in a world now where like everything is explained and if it's not explained, everything should be explained, you know, and there's this aspect of Hinduism, which is like, let's just wonder, like, let's just think about what is the nature of reality. Let's just think about like, how did all this come? Let's just think about like what happens afterwards. Like there's an, there's some beauty in not knowing everything. And the modern world is we have to know everything, you know? And Hinduism is like, it's okay not to know. It's okay to wonder. It's okay to be like, be surprised by the majesty of the natural world. And I really feel like that's something that a lot of us lose, right? That's like a childlike attitude. When you're a child, you don't know everything. That's why everything is amazing. And then you're an adult and you realize everything is crappy, you know? And it's like that middle ground of like maintaining that wonder, I think is something really important as well. Yeah. I think we just have a maybe a minute or so before we have to go back. Any final thoughts or reflections before we go back to the main group? I want to know what Chet, I want to know what Chetan's made for dinner. That's what I want to know. <laughs> Put some dal to to cook. I was I was chopping the onions and yeah, the garlic and everything while Bisha was joining. <laughs> And so lucky. Yeah. Yeah. As you were talking about like sourcing your food, I was holding a tomato in my hand and wondering whether or not this tomato was grown ethically or was came from a climate that supported it. <laughs> That's yeah, a tough one. Think. That's a tough one. Yeah, yeah. Like, did it go? Did, did in the Hudson Valley? Did tomatoes grow up there? I never know really what grows up there or not. I, I doubt it, but certainly not this time of the year. Even if it does, so. <laughs> <laughs> How are we doing? Are we, are we, is everyone back or are we still waiting for some people? We're all back. Okay, because I can't see Vidima, so. She had to drop off for a class. Oh, okay. <laughs> she's, she's run outside. She wants to go hug a tree or something like that. You know, she's like, I got to do this now. So thank you all for um, coming back and still being with us. Um, we have about 10, 15 minutes left. So. Um, we had a great conversation in our group um, and I'm really this last closing 10, 15 minutes is really just for if anybody wants to share or reflect back on um, the conversations that we've had or any thoughts that are coming to them or any questions they have either for myself or for the, for the larger group as well. This is really just a final closing time just for some final reflections and open floor. So, so please, anybody would like to share or any questions from, from anyone? And can people unmute themselves, Vishwajit? Yeah. I, I've got a question. So earlier you said that today's economic models don't include the environment, which totally makes sense, right? It's capitalism, which and it, there's a perfectly good reason why that's the economic model for today. Uh, so then is there a version of capitalism that does include the environment as a part of it in the future? Yeah, so... Um, I would say like there's a shift increasingly towards what they're calling conscious capitalism. Like a um, number of and you're seeing like indicators that, that the current economic models are broken, right? So you're seeing the emergence of 
ESG or impact investing. ESG is what environmental, social, and governance or something like that, where it's like like a triple bottom line. Like you can't just think about profits. You have to think about people and you have to think about planet as well, right? So that's increasingly being something that companies and industries are having to really lean into is just focusing on profits. That was a model for a previous age and a previous time, but that's no longer you know, viable going forward, given the situation. Um, you actually have this, the, the Secretary General of the UN gave a speech a couple of months ago. And actually he said that GDP is increasingly an outdated marker of, of, of measuring growth. You know, so when you have the Secretary General of the United Nations even talking about GDP needing to be revised, it means that conversations are taking place at a very high level that things need to shift. So you're definitely seeing shifts at that level and I think more importantly, you, I think we're seeing shifts at like at a grassroots of like all of you here, you're all students, like you're growing up with understandings of sustainability and climate change and so on. So with, for people like of your generation, of, you know, your age group, this is something that's baked into your psyche and your consciousness, you know, and like I find like younger people will think twice before they do something that's going to be environmentally damaging, whereas an older generation wouldn't even think about it. They would just litter and pollute and do whatever they need to to make money but a younger generation is much more conscious about the environmental impact. So that's going to have a shift as well. And I think over the next 10 to 20 years, you're going to see the climate, the environment is going to force us to shift our economic models, whether we want to or not, because we just can't go on as businesses no more. Um, I, had, I had a question about, um, so Hinduism is is a very small percentage of the like the vast majority of people and humans on the earth, um, and uh, you know we as like a collective force we do have these beliefs and we do um, respect nature, um, but how how do you apply this to because it has to be a team effort it has to be done through um, you know between like everyone on the earth as a collective effort. Uh, how would you recommend Im implementation of that? Well, what I would suggest, and I, it's, a, it's a really good, important question, is that because part of the challenge is like, because we're such an unorganized, unstructured religion, you know, we don't have a church to work through or formal institutions in that sense as other organized or other faith traditions do. It's sometimes hard to know how we can affect change. Um, what I would say and what I found has um, been helpful for us and the work we've done is to lean more into the values and the principles of Hinduism. Um, you know, because you know, there, there are the values and the principles of Hinduism, then there's the culture and the societal stuff as well. You know? So there's the Garbha and all that kind of stuff, which is the cultural stuff, but there are the values and the principles which really kind of you know, strengthen that inner life, you know, which I spoke about earlier about like nonviolence or, or sattva of goodness or dharma. And I find like speaking about those values, they're universal, right? They're not, they're not limited to Hinduism. They're not just limited to the Dharmic faith traditions. Everyone recognizes the importance of non-harming. Everyone recognizes the importance of living in harmony and balance with the natural world. And so our approach is to find the common ground, right? Common ground with other faith organizations, but also common ground with institutions like the United Nations or the World Bank or, or governments and see what their kind of priorities are, see what direction they're thinking to go and see where that overlaps with us and see where we can push them in a new direction, right? So if I give you one example that we're working on, you know, the current legal framework that we have, again, doesn't include nature. So you can destroy the environment and there's no legal repercussions for that, right? So there's a movement now called the rights of nature, which is taking ground at the UN level, which is that nature has a right to exist. A tree, a river, a mountain has a legal personhood. And by harming, that those aspects of nature, there are legal implications of that. Now that's a very Hindu understanding that everything has personhood, everything has dignity, everything has a right to life, right? So that's a cause that I feel the Hindu community can really get behind that the right of life to that of that tree is just as important as my right to life. There is no differentiation on the spiritual level, right? And if we can get behind that, indigenous communities have that worldview, a lot of other East Asian traditions like Shintoism and so on have those worldviews. And so it's about what we found is, is helpful is to focus on the values and the principles that Hinduism advocates for and find the common ground in other, other organizations and institutions. Is that, is that helpful? Does that make sense? Yeah, do you, do you like lobby for these beliefs then? 
Um, I wouldn't say lobby, but in, in the UN, the word is advocate. So we, 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 we join committees, we join working groups, we join conferences, we issue statements, we work in coalitions with other organizations to really push these ideas forward. Because, because what I found is that there are so many people out there who resonate with the Hindu worldview, but may not want to call themselves or don't identify as a Hindu, right? But they have a common cause with us. So it's finding those, that allyship and pushing this agenda forward, you know, rights of nature, the way women should be respected and treated in the world, you know, so many concerns that we have in the world. There's so many that so many things that Hinduism can speak to. So it's about finding those partnerships and finding those avenues through which we can advocate for them. Yeah. Thank you. Um, thank you for um, for sharing that. I um, I'm an Aboriginal woman from Australia, and so um, listening to the uh, to you speak this morning. Oh, so it's th sorry Thursday morning in Australia. Um, Good morning. <laughs> thanks. Um, it, it reminds me of a tradition, an Aboriginal tradition that comes from Central Australia, which is called the Didi, and it's about listening to and tuning into nature. Um, we have a social obligation to care for country, to enable that country um, to be um, available in the way that it is for us, for our future generation. So we have, um, we teach our, our kids that idea that um, what we do has a lasting impact for other people. So it's our responsibility to ensure that we care for the country that we're on so that it, it's available for everyone. So like, yeah, the, it is certainly something that resonates across most First Nations uh, around the world. I know um, First Nations, uh, America and um, Americans and um, Canadians have that philosophy as well and um yeah thank you for talking about allyship and and um and, uh, and finding that common ground yeah yeah no, that's great thank you for thank you for being with us and that's such an important point like i love like i don't know how common it is but you know in, in here in the in north america or indigenous communities here they have this understanding that whatever action you perform you have to think seven generations ahead right and you may see for those of you who shop in whole foods you may see that um, that cleaning company called Seventh Generation. I don't know if they make like toilet paper and they make cleaners and stuff like that. And Seventh Generation comes from this idea, this indigenous idea that whatever you do, you have to think seven generations ahead because that's the impact that you're going to have. It's such a it's such a different way of looking at the world than the way we the way we live right now. Yeah. So thank you for sharing that. Uh, I just have a small question, Gopal. So. As you said, uh, change should start from inside. And uh, if we think uh, on a daily basis, even our life habits or may be like, may not be in accordance with the natural laws, we may think. So uh, what are some of the key points that we should keep in mind while filtering out those, you know, habits or something so that we can start living in accordance, more accordance with the nature? Sure. Yeah, no, it's a, it's a good question. And it's, it, it speaks to this other aspect of Hinduism, which is that we can never be perfect, right? We, we can always just try our best with integrity and sincerity. That's all we can do. Um, and, you know, we know that we're never going to be perfect, right? If we were perfect, we wouldn't be here. We would be somewhere else, right? I mean, it, it's the path of perfection. It's getting to that point of perfection at some point, right? So it's about, you know, like I said, I think there are two things. First is just lo just looking at our daily life and just looking at you know our levels of consumption, you know where we're getting our food from, you know how often maybe we're flying, um, you know are we recycling, are we buying things in plastic bags and things like that. You know that that's just one kind of like external level. You know just to think about those things, right? Just you know, and those are very obvious things that the city of New York or the state of New York kind of asks us to do anyway, right? So it's just being mindful and conscious of those things. And then internally, I think it's about having that meditation, which I, which we shared earlier, which is like, how can I, how can I be of service in this moment? You know, like, what do I have? That's what are my connections? What are my skills? How do I, how am I utilizing my time in the service of humanity? Right. And I think that if we have that prayer, like with the sincerity and with the earnestness, I think, the answers come to us, right? And so that's that's the inner mantra, the inner dialogue that we need to be having, you know, because in many ways, it's not so much what we do, but it's how we do it, right? 
And so how we do it is, is, is a reflection on our consciousness and our, and our state of mind. And so I would offer that because I, I can't, I don't want to offer one particular Hindu thing because there are so many Hindu things. You know, if you're a Krishna devotee, I would suggest like do this, this, and this. If you're like a Ram Bhakta, you do something else. If you worship Lord Shiva, you do something else. So each of the Hindu traditions and lineages and schools of thought have their own ways of developing that inner life, that inner contentment with, with the world, you know? Um, so if you have your own lineage or you have your own practice, you know, lean into that a bit more. Um, and if, if you're searching for your practice, start with that practice of just how can I be of service in this moment? Well, how can I make a contribution? How can I be a blessing on the earth? And I really do feel with those questions, you know, an answer does come from, from within. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, I had one quick question about the work that you did in India, Kupalji, uh, with like the temples, because um, mm -hmm. um, I've heard that, you know, you've worked with these big temples, which has like huge inflow of people and like resources and stuff like that. And obviously there's a lot of waste. And I think you did some work around that. Um, how was that like? Or, like? Yeah, so we did a lot of work in India, like 2013, 2012 to like 2015, 2016 time, like we worked with temples in Rishikesh and Varanasi and Dwarka and Puri and Vrindavan and Rameshwaram and Ujjain and, you know, so many places, a lot of the big Hindu pilgrimage sites. And, um, you know, back then, environmental issues, climate change was really just like coming into the fore as like a, as a concern that, you know, people in India were like taking seriously. And, you know, I'll be honest with you, like we were what we found was like there was overwhelming interest from the temples, overwhelming interest. No one turned us away and said, like, we don't care about the environment or we don't want to do it. You know, we actually developed um, we, we developed the first ever green temples guide for Hindu temples. It's it may be available still online. We consulted over 30 temples across India and the guide looks at seven different thematic areas that a Hindu temple should consider when it wants to be green and environmentally friendly. So. We had, a, we had significant interest and uptake in this kind of work. Where the gap was, and this is the gap that we weren't able to fill, unfortunately, was kind of, we could educate the temples in terms of like best practice and, and the issues, but we weren't able to resource them in order to carry out the, the work, right? You know, so it's like, we were able to initiate projects, like we did cleanups in towns and, you know, education camps and different things like that. But we weren't able, ironically enough, we weren't able to make it sustainable, like in the sense of like operationally sustainable so the temples could do it after we left, right? And that was the gap that we had when we were a much younger organization back then. But what we've seen since is quite phenomenal. And we, we did research in 2018, 2019 around um, Hindu temples and uptake of solar energy. And we found that most of the, well, I wouldn't say most, but an, a significant number of the major Hindu temples in India have got switched over to solar, you know, so like where it's the Tirupati temple or the, the Jagannath temple in Puri or the Brahma Kumari's ashram in Abu, you know, you name it, even the Shuddhi temple, um, the Shuddhi Sai Baba temple, they have solar powering their kitchen and they have, I think it's like kinetic energy in the floor. So when you walk in the temple, it generates energy that powers the temple, right? Because these temples have like hundreds of thousands of pilgrims every single day. So what we found is um, in the last couple of years, there's been a real exponential increase in interest from Hindu institutions in India, but also practical action as well. And um, it's not just in solar energy, but it's also waste management. It's also in like um, what they call reforestation, which is planting trees and so on like that. You know, then you have the big organizations like the Isha Foundation doing great work and Art of Living and ISKCON and Chinmay Mission and so on. So you're seeing like a lot of grassroots activity, but also national activity as well by these big Hindu institutions. So you're seeing like a wave of activity amongst Hindu groups. And we were really grateful and we had a lot of fun working with this, these Hindu temples at a very early stage of having these conversations. And you know, we, for example, um, a lot of Hindu pilgrimage takes place in tiger reserves in India. So we did um, a project in the, um, the Tiger Reserve of Ranthambore, which is in Rajasthan, I think South Rajasthan. There's a, there's a tiny Ganesh temple in the Tiger Reserve. And every August, hundreds of thousands of pilgrims go to the temple and cause disruption in the wildlife park and to the tigers and so on. 
So we did a campaign working with the um, wildlife conservation groups there and the temple authorities and so on to educate the pilgrims on the impact that their pilgrimage was having on the tigers in, in that park. And you go to every single tiger reserve in India, all of them have significant Hindu pilgrimages that go through them. And it causes major disruption to the tigers. You know, so that, that's the kind of work we did. So it was a lot of fun. And as I said, the interest was always in, no one ever turned us away from the, from the Hindu side. It was just more of a case of resourcing and e equipping them to do the work. Yeah. Wow, that's super interesting. Thanks so much for sharing, Gopalji. And before we conclude, do, do you wanna, is there any final comments or concluding remarks would you like to share with us? Um, no, I wanna thank you all for being with us on a, on a Wednesday evening and you know, letting me share a few thoughts and to engage with the topic. And um, you know, I would just say that you know, this is, you know, when we, as young Hindus or as younger Hindus, like we see the world, we see what, it, what is our contribution, what can we do to you know, um, make the world a better place, to put our stamp on it, you know, to further the agenda on, on issues. And I would say that, you know, as in my answer earlier to, to you, Aniruda, is that, you know, there are so many people out there who align with the Hindu worldview. You know, they may not speak like us, they may not sound like us, but their values are the same as us. And you'll find that across the religious traditions, and you'll find that across the whole world as well. And I think if we want to make a world which is more nonviolent, if we want to make a world that is more dharmic, it's finding those allies to do that work with, and really leaning into the values and the principles that Hinduism gives us. And by leaning into those, we can really not just address the climate crisis and the biodiversity crisis, but as I mentioned, all these other crises that we're facing, the health crisis, you know, issues around women empowerment, of human trafficking, all of these issues are a symptom of a deeper cause, which is a, a disease in the, human, in the human community these days of, of, of greed, of imbalance. And if we can address the root cause, these other issues naturally resolve themselves. So I'd really encourage all of you to, to find out what your contribution is, to try your best. And, you know, as Krishna says in the Gita to Arjun, do your work, but don't be attached to the work. You know, do it with the right intention. That's all you can do. And the result you have to leave to God. We have to, because we're not in control. God is in control. All we're in control of is our contribution, our consciousness in the work itself. So that's what I would encourage all of you to do as much as possible and please reach out to me if you want to take this conversation forward you know i'm sure aman and vishwajit can share my email address i'm very happy to you know have further conversations with you one-on-one -on -one or in a group setting um our organization boomi global is we're here to serve all of you to to do what we can to make the world a better place so thank you again great thank you so much for joining before we conclude guys we'll do the shanti mantra so I'll start and then we can say it together. We can uh, you know, close your eyes, moment of peace. It, it literally means uh, uh, mantra of peace. <clears throat> Om Sarve Bhavantu Sukhinaha Sarve Santu Niramaya Sarve Bhadrani Pashyantu Ma Kaschitukha Bhag Bhavet Om Shanti 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 Thanks everyone for joining. Namaste. Thanks. Thank you all. Good night.